Hello there, this is Aiden Jonah Editor and Chief of the Canada Files, coming in with another edition in the introduction of the series for Canada and Palestine, the War on Zionism. Again, with bad news. That is that the encampment at McGill has been forcibly dispersed, i.e. Uh, has been cracked down upon. So that unfortunately leaves another encampment down for the count. Now, this encampment, they didn't go voluntarily, which, as you'll learn, is an improvement from the others that uh, have come around recently. But that's the situation there. Now I'm going to take you into the usual introduction to the latest episode of Canada and Palestine, The War on Zionism. Hello, Canada Files viewers. This is Aiden Jonah, Editor-in-Chief of Canada Files here, along with Laith Maroof. We are co-hosting the eighth episode of Canada and Palestine, The War on Zionism. Laith, thanks for joining me yet again. Thank you for having me. All right, Laith. Well, as per usual, we have so much to discuss. Let's get right into the situation for the axis of resistance. Uh, take us through this. Oh, yeah. I mean, yesterday Hezbollah released uh, these part two of the Hopo video of surveillance, as they promised us with the first one. The first one was uh, surveilling the area around Haifa. This video was surveilling the uh, Syrian occupied Golan Heights. And it was remarkable because it, they noted three different surveillance, uh, you know, of operations so we could see snow in the beginning on top of the mountains around these spaces and then spring coming and right now summer including one of the uh, locations was just uh, surveyed last month in june so what does this tell us from this video uh, number one is that they're able to go over the most important bases uh, for the whole Zionist colony. There's eight bases that are on the Golan Heights, including at the top of Mount Hermon, three of them that are um, called the eyes of the state uh, for the Zionist colony. These are surveillance and uh, radar and uh, electronic warfare positions that can actually see all the way to the mountain ranges uh, that define the border between Iraq and Iran and the mountain ranges in the south of Turkey, Taurus. So this is these are the most important information gathering and command and control for air and intelligence that the Zionists have. So we see the video from Hezbollah. And by the way, everybody can watch a English translated version that we just posted on Free Palestine TV. You can check uh, on our Twitter account and our Rumble account. Um, please also donate to freepalestine.video. And um, anyway, so uh, this this uh, is very probably worrying for the Zionists. We saw Hezbollah target many of these spaces over the last week, including the one on top of Mount Hermon. Um, and, uh, you know, the Zionists have no defense, it seems like. I mean, the last time they claimed that these drones were able to fly over Haifa and were not shot down because they didn't want to scare the civilians, quote unquote, the colonists that live around Haifa. What is the excuse with not shooting down these drones over Syria's occupied Golan Heights? It tells you basically that the Israelis didn't even notice them. They couldn't shoot them down. And uh, the intelligence is, the gathering of Hezbollah is still ongoing. Uh, this is in terms of what's happening in uh, Lebanon. There's huge battles back and forth, uh, bombardments uh, for weeks now. Um, uh, in terms of what's happening in Gaza, we heard from the Lancet, uh, the most premier medical journal in the world, that at least 180 somewhat thousand Palestinians uh, have been martyred since the beginning of this war nine months ago, and that this is a lowball estimate. 
uh, clearly, even if we say 250,000 people, that's one out of 10 dead. You add to that the injured, you're probably talking about half of the population either dead or injured in the West, in uh, in, in Gaza in the last nine months. This is the uh, most uh, severe, fastest genocide we've seen in um, since World War II. Uh, the highest number of uh, injured, and specifically that the highest number of amputees in history of any population. The fastest, uh, largest, um, you know, batch of amputees in the world, and this is going to just continue. I, you know. The war is going to actually expand and everybody should get ready for more genocide. But everybody should understand also that we will see these huge numbers happening also in the Zionist colony. We'll see a lot of dead Zionists as soon as this war expands. All right, Leith. Well, thanks for taking us through uh, all these fronts. So I think now we should turn our eye to events around uh, Canada, and there's a fair bit of stuff going on. I think the obvious place to start is the encampments. And remember, uh, well, obviously when we recorded, uh, I had to put an ad num afterwards because the U of T encampment voluntarily went down only a few hours after we recorded. Uh, well, uh, we've had more encampments go down. The University of British Columbia encampment went down on the 8th, and... Well, uh, also on the 8th, University of Waterloo 2. Uh, last week, I had called it. I had said in the next month or two, uh, you would see all the encampments going down. The you know the political elite in Canada wouldn't tolerate it anymore. Well, looks like, a, looks like I was unfortunately right. And I feel like this is the kind of momentum towards these encampments getting cracked down upon. So like, I think you'll have a lot to say about this and the U of T move as well. But... To me, this kind of sparks the beginning of this is very clearly the end, the end times for the encampment movement of sorts. Right. Uh, and if so, if you think so, take us through your feelings there and then take us into what other act tactics can come instead. When these encampments started going up uh, at the end of the fall semester, it was clear to me that these students must uh, immediately start thinking about what next and how to take the momentum that they have and move it to the street, how to become more radical, because, uh, you know, it, it is useless in a, in a way to do these encampments if you're not going to radicalize people. Uh, and clearly, the majority of those who led these encampments seem to be liberal uh, non-violent, quote-unquote. And therefore, if I was a Zionist, I would have done the same thing to them. I would have put the pressure. I wouldn't have cared. I wouldn't have given them any uh, coverage in the media. And that's, you know, they were lucky that they were getting some coverage in the Zionist media. If I was a Zionist in control of media, I would just, you know, ignore the whole thing. Because as long as you don't... Uh, represent a threat, a real threat to the status quo, to the government uh, and the structures of power in a country, you are irrelevant in the outcomes of historic moments as we see right now. So you look at uh, these encampments and clearly none of their leaders have any backbone they do not want to be arrested. They don't want to be beaten. They do not want to fight for the liberation of Palestine. Anyone that wants to stand up for Palestine should be ready to go to jail, to have their livelihood uh, you know, taken away, to see their, you know, to see their bodies being assaulted. And that's the least of it. And I say this, uh, you know, knowing that these youth, maybe it's their first moments of uh, political awareness that they're that they are uh, going through, but that doesn't excuse this limp, basically uh, unique, non-power-based movement. You have to confront the Zionist. 
and and I and I think I would, you know, I would understand my Palestinian Arabic and Muslim black black brothers and sisters in these encampments that didn't want to get arrested. They are the main target of the fascism that is in the West right now. But you know what? The quote-unquote Jewish anti-Zionist, they are as bad as their Zionist uh, you know, compatriots uh, because they only are taking air, sucking air out of the Palestinian movement and taking this public space on it. Uh, they're collecting money and uh, donations wait, and what wait, have wait, you. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, this yes. is getting worse. Uh, the uh, University of Ottawa encampment is gone to Palestine. It's really, like I was saying last week, it's it, two months. I mean, two months now seems extremely optimistic. Wow. I mean, let's see if the encampment movement lasts another two weeks. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. But this, you know, that that the Jewish anti-Zionist, quote unquote, members of these encampments, I expect them to actually go and confront the Zionists in their synagogues, in their community centers, in their organizations, in their lobby groups. Otherwise, they are just benefiting from even the suffering of Palestinians. This look look at how many. New Jewish names that now are become a celebrity in Canada, just like the the celebrities that were made at my time, like Aaron Matte and so on, that have now made a living about talking about Palestine, but have never risked anything in their life for Palestine. So I I, I would say to my brothers and sisters that are Palestinians, Arab and Muslim in these encampments that you should be putting these Jewish uh, new voices in their place, that you should be ordering them to take more radical positions that you cannot as a, as a Palestinian Arab and Muslim. Otherwise, listen, uh, you can't do something that was done 20 years ago and expect it to work when it didn't work 20 years ago. I mean, look, uh, so this is probably going to be a point where IGV is going to be quite unhappy with me, but I mean... I I hate to to say it, um, but I'm sure you're familiar with Richard Marceau, right? Well, so IJV uh, made a post in one of the posts in a thread. Sija is not a credible source. It does not represent Canadian Jews. But then Marceau raised a very tough question. Obviously, he's a hardcore Zionist. Uh, so it's more so a rebuttal that he was trying to make. But he said, uh, I'll read this out. Um, the vast majority of Canada's Jews, 91%, identify with Zionism, the right to Jewish self-determination in the state of Israel. Only 3% of Jews are anti-Zionist. Now, this is one one uh, case, right, in terms of uh, a study, so forth, uh, generally. Um, but at the same time, that's a staggering uh, stat, and it does kind of raise the question of, you know, when IJV speaks how they speak and the confidence they speak, you know, how much people do they actually represent? And, you know, uh, how much uh, how much can they offer with the base of support they have within uh, within the Jewish population uh, in, in Canada? Right. Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's already problematic just in the naming. You know, these organizations undermine themselves and actually tell you that we don't speak on behalf of the Jews when they call themselves independent. Jewish voices, or uh, what's the other one in um, Jewish v voice for peace? I mean, call yourself the Canadian Jewish Congress, for instance. There's no more Canadian Jewish Congress. There used to be. Why don't you take the name? Why don't you? Why do you always have to uh, make yourself already a marginal from your name? They don't want to speak on behalf of the Jewish community. And if you notice this independent Jewish voices or others, they purposefully refuse to work with the religious anti-Zionist anti, -Jew, anti Jewish movement. You know, they don't want to work with Natura Carta or Torah Jews. They look down at these true Jewish uh, movements that are uh, anti-Zionist. So there's multiple problems with organizations like IJV or others. So 
They don't want to say that they represent the Jewish community, although the Zionists always brag about that they speak on behalf of every Jew. They don't want to work with the uh, religious anti-Zionist Jews. They don't want to take any radical positions or take actions that are could actually threaten. Actually, wait a second, Leif, Leif. I think you might be positioned to talk about this. There's groups like Torah Judaism, right? Wouldn't those be? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to I talked to them before when I back in the fall slash near winter of last year, uh, when there's that National Palestine Rally uh, in Ottawa. And yeah, they, they they seem very very committed to the, pa the Palestinian cause. Uh, you would you would think surely wouldn't that be you know with the imaging and this the rhetoric of independent Jewish voices, wouldn't that be a natural you know ally tactical alliance? Yes, but they look down at them. They see them as fanatics. They see them as you know, uh, oppressive of women or they this or that. So they decide that they're holier than thou than anybody else as IJB, including they're better than the Palestinians like myself who speak to uh, rowdy or to, uh, to, to aggressive or whatever they want to call it. So, you know, ultimately they're useless. Any Jewish person who calls himself anti-Zionist, who's not willing to actually risk their life for me as a Palestinian, who is not willing to have a direct confrontation with the Zionist Jews that speak on their behalf and are genociding my people on their name, are useless to me, are actually an, another enemy that I should be fighting. All right. Well, let's not spend too much time on the en encampments uh, front further than that. Uh, we'll see how things go in the next week uh, and if we have more to talk about on that front. The other things I was thinking about, well, let's talk about people that put their neck on the line. Laith, you nearly got assassinated. What the hell went on there, man? Yes, uh, I mean... We were got down south in uh, on the border with Palestine. Uh, we were filming in the Marjayun region, uh, overlooking the Hula Valley uh, in Palestine, and the Matula base. We witnessed uh, the Zionists uh, firing multiple uh, white phosphorus shells in the valley under us, and then we were heading to Nabatia Fauqa, just very close, like uh, also on the border to interview uh, a resident there. And uh, and what has happened is that uh, while we were driving around in the village, the um, uh, we, we just had a, a, a white phosphorus shell fired right beside us, 200 meters away. And we started filming and then another shell uh, fired from um, a drone also uh, hits right beside us we were lucky that there's a you know a, a, a half a wall fence cement uh, just bes between us and the field and it took uh, some of the sharp nails so we were not uh, injured um, and you know firefighters and ambulances came and they asked us to leave so i i you know looking at the fact that there's there was nothing around us no action, no places that were hit. Uh, it, you know, it it seems like that the Zionist forces noticed our car and decided to fire beside it. Uh, maybe they noticed our uh, cell signal. I'm not sure exactly what prompted them to to attack. But yeah, we we survived this, and and that shows you how dangerous it is to. Uh, do direct uh, coverage of the front in uh, Lebanon. Right, Leif. Uh, so, obviously, the Canfels will be have an article uh, on this, so that'll be there as well. So, there's just, of course, just in that self, the, the risk and the targeting of your life is obviously not something that I think is a prospect that deters you at all but it's quite the uh quite the risk for you to take on though uh but in terms of the 
kind of Palestine in front. I mean, I know uh, Dimitri Lascaris was actually, he went down to uh, to Toronto recently. Lascaris has obviously been a very vocal voice around Palestinian liberation. He is, he's back in Canada. Uh, so what do you think about uh, some of his uh, recent advocacy? I know you, you know, actually do get interviewed by him once in a while. Yeah, Dimitri is doing great. I mean, um, he also is is getting targeted, uh, not uh, physically as happened with me this week. But I mean, he is being targeted by the right wing in Canada. And, and at sometimes it seems like he's being undermined by the same voices we were talking about just before the uh, quote unquote anti-Zionist uh, Jews like IJV or others. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's clear that his voice is now one of the loudest in Canada. And I encourage him to continue and doing his work. Uh, and I do also encourage him to think about maybe re-entering the political arena in terms of elections. Uh, uh, as we see the Green Party is falling apart again, there is a possibility for uh, taking over this party from the Zionist um, and, and to have some voice in the electoral process in Canada. Although I personally don't believe in that there is anything called democracy really and or that they will uh, allow people like Dimitri or others uh, to to win uh, you know majorities or control governments in the West. Certainly, uh, dep depending on what Dimitri could do, he certainly could raise... Uh, a lot of noise. So I think I think I think around the encampment, a Toronto point where I'm also curious for your thoughts. Um, you know, labor had some organized labor leaders had made big talk about supporting the encampment. Um, but what do you think about the conduct of organized labor leadership? You know, in Canada throughout, you know, the uh, the, the ramping up of the of the genocide since October seventh. You know, have they actually done a mildly functional job or have they just really let things down as a whole? Yeah, it's been a very big disappointment, the labor movements in Canada. Uh, I mean, some of these labor unions are, you know, the richest uh, you can think about in North America. Uh, in Quebec specifically, uh, the FTQ and others have... Uh, retirement funds that are in the tens of billions of dollars. If these labor unions uh, really wanted to do anything, uh, I mean, all of them have passed the BDS over the last 15 years, but if they want to do anything, the least they can do is withdraw their investments in uh, Zionist and or military uh, companies. And they're not doing that. Uh, so do I... Do I respect these labor unions? No, I don't. Uh, look at, uh, have they been out fully as unions in the demonstrations? It's been nine months. I haven't seen one demonstration that has uh, been called by labor unions where the labor unions ordered their members to come out. Otherwise, we would have had a half a million people demonstrating in Montreal, for instance. Last time, the labor unions called for demonstrations and in, uh, enforced their membership to come out was in the 2012 demonstrations. Students led demonstrations against the increase in uh, tuition fees, and we saw half a million people come out. Have we seen that yet in Canada? It's been nine months. Out and out genocide that the Canadian government uh, and the Canadian weapon manufacturers are deeply involved in. That didn't happen. So I think the leadership of these labor unions is also complicit in the genocide. You know, there's no more diplomacy when we need to talk about these things. We have to point fingers at these individuals and say, you are responsible for the genocide that's happening. And I, I, I don't have any more respect for much of these unions looking at how weak they have been since the since uh, October last year. All right. Well, the last thing I'll say on the Canada front is uh, Birju Datani, 
uh, that new head of the Kane uh, Human Rights Commission is still getting roped or doped and run around. Uh, apparently, they're now strengthening vetting. Um, so uh, I have to avoid, you know, missing stuff that they missed with him. So just with him, just continuing to show that uh, having no backbone doesn't pay off. Um, he will meet his political downfall. He is a laughable, pathetic man. And uh, what can I say? Uh, good riddance. I couldn't really care less. You know, it's like you said last week, right? You know, these people who speak of Palestine but can't keep their uh, principle and just back off and say stupid things about the resistance. Uh, they, you know, they do more harm than good. I mean, I, I think let's be honest here. Let's look at someone like Fred Hahn in Ontario, who would, who would spoke up about Palestine and hated about, oh, resistance, you know, just by, you know, something along those lines, right? But then completely backs off under pressure. These people who want to put themselves as the brave heroes or whatever, uh, and they flop and whatever, they just, they drive people again towards opportunistic positions. And they don't, they don't really hold their value. Uh, they don't really offer value in my view. Uh, you know, principled, principled people should be backed and unprincipled people should be left to like flounder and at best maybe follow those who are principled. Yes, yes. And uh, look at the appointment of uh, Anthony Housefather. Of course. The... Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We'll talk about that a little bit for sure. Uh, let's go yeah. on. So, so it's clearly done as a appeasement because of this uh, whole story with the, you know, the head of the Human Rights Commission. So uh, it's the timing, you know. There's a public flogging of a brown Muslim guy that dared retweet something. That's the head of the Human Rights Commission. At the same time, there's a public annotation of uh, Anthony Housefather as the uh, arbiter of what is anti-Jewish. And, uh, and you know, you look at how this is also uh, coupled with, uh, you know, countries like, uh, or let's say Meta right now, just yesterday, announced that it's going to be banning the use of the word Zionist. Oh, of course, word... yeah, well, I think we all saw that. Yeah, so so you could see it how right now it's becoming fully a religious conceptualization. These states in the West, these companies in the West, they believe uh, they're not anymore quote unquote secular where they never were, but they are now theocracies, and the state of Canada is enforcing this theocracy uh, that, that if you uh dare question the god the idol of israel it is an idol uh, uh, uh that you will be ex uh, excommunicated from society you'll be maybe jailed you'll be silenced you'll be fired uh your life will be destroyed that is the epitome of theocracy uh, and, uh, you know, seems like the Canadian public is fine with it. This What's funny part about it is that the majority of Canadians are not Jewish. They're not Zionist. But this majority that are Christian and secular are having to acknowledge publicly that Judaism and this fascist Jewish white supremacy of the chosen people is a reality. A Canadian non-Jew right now has to admit that Jews are chosen people and they're the best thing that ever came to humanity since, uh, you know, toast bread. Otherwise, uh, they can't even be a Canadian. This is, this, look at Germany, you know, with citizenship pro, uh, being now uh, uh, coupled with, like, you have to admit that Israel has the right to exist. It's like you have to admit God uh, of Israel is the only God. That's basically in Germany. This is where people in the West that uh, don't agree with these things have to realize is you're now past the moment of, of just debating these issues. You have to take action. Otherwise, you're just going to end up in concentration camps with, with the Arabs and Muslims that are going to be rounded up very soon. Right. So speaking of uh, speaking of 
uh, action life. Uh, what are your thoughts on action? Uh, that can be taken in the place of, well, what uh, has to be considered pretty strong defeats with the encampments, right? And a lack of momentum from that. Yep. They have to go and occupy and destroy the weapon manufacturers in Canada that are working with Israel. That's that's the minimum action they should be doing. They should go and shut down synagogues that are preaching hate. Jewish progressives, quote-unquote, anti-Zionist, IJV, should crash into a synagogue on the Sabbath and take out the, the preachers of hate that are on the pulpit. Anything less than that is irrelevant to me. Canadian... So like force force them out, like force them off the uh, force them off the pulpit. You're saying, yeah. Yes, take your take your synagogues back, take your community organizations back, or you're a complicit. It doesn't matter to me what you say. You're not taking action. You're sitting on the side and watching and blabbing. That doesn't help me as a Palestinian. In fact, it only reemphasizes. Oh, there's you know, like we watched. Uh, there was the 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 shitty debate on uh, Pierce Morgan with Aaron Maté and uh, uh, Gidon Levy and two Zionists, four Jews speaking on behalf of the Palestinians, debating each other. And you know what the Zionist did? Uh, he said, wow, this is the best example of how of Jewish tradition. You know, four Jews and you have five opinions. Mm, amazing. Jews are so better than everybody else. You see how it is? Even the... The when when anti-Zionist Jews speak out, it re-emphasizes Jewish white supremacy if they don't take action. Therefore, I don't need to hear any more Aaron Mattes. I don't hear need to hear any more voices from IJV. I need to see them take action. Otherwise, they're part of the problem that reasserts Jewish white supremacy. For sure, for sure. I think what what's the important on the end of the day, on the positive side of things, is that the resistance and generally, let's look, honestly, in the resistance of colonialism and imperialism has never re relied upon the actions of those in the imperial core, which is a good thing because if it did, we would still have the 1800s situation, right? But it doesn't. And so the world's changing regardless. It's just a question of can these actions in the imperial core be challenged and can uh, can these people fight for positive change and improve their situation at home as a bonus that comes along with that um or are they going to watch as their system implodes um and they when they can't exploit anymore things just deteriorate and collapse because unless they make these kind of changes there's just going to be a societal collapse at some point when they can't exploit any further. That's what that's been the basis of, for example, Canadian society, U.S. society, right? The colonial point of it, right? Colonialism, imperialism. These things uh, can't even if imperialism can't function, it's it's just not going to function as a society. So people kind of just have to decide what kind of future they want and how much suffering they want to put themselves through if they truly are so terrified of acting. They might want to start being more terrified of what will come afterwards if they don't act now yes you're right you're definitely right it's uh it's it's you know it's going to be too late very soon to act if you haven't organized if you haven't built alternative organizational structures uh survival mechanisms what have you once once this war blows out into a regional uh situation it's going to be too late for uh, any change to happen. And uh, good luck for our Canadian uh, viewers. Uh, maybe they can take heed from our warnings right now and prepare themselves for uh, what's going to come next. Okay. Well, Laith, I think it's uh, going to be left there this episode. Uh, Laith, as per usual, thank you for co-hosting the latest episode of Canada and Palestine, The War on Zionism. And thank you to Canada Files viewers for watching all the way to the end of this episode. If you want to enjoy this analysis that comes from both me and Laith, you can support the journalism 
of the Canada Files financially and support the journalism of Free Palestine TV financially. So to the audience, thank you. And to Leith, thank you for being the co-host as per usual. See you soon. Uh, See you soon. All right, bye.